I haven't been here very long, but I like it. And glory to God for that, right? Right? I actually visited this school when I was in the eighth grade. My parents thought it was a good idea uh, that this would be a good place. But I was not in the mindset to appreciate a place uh, like this, and so I chose another school. And I think if I had been in the right place and chosen this school, I would have been greatly blessed. But the Lord is gracious. He was very patient with me and brought me back around um, after a long time of not walking with the Lord. Well, let's pray because let the Lord be magnified here. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together on your wonderful Sabbath. We thank you that we are here and we have freedom and joy and ability to praise you, to tell of your wonderful testimonies, to tell of your goodness, and to bring back a good report. May you be glorified this evening, Father. Amen. Please join me in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, you will find the disciples' very first mission trip. And it starts there in verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve. This is Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two. Is that recognizable, search students? Yes, buddy system, right? By two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. Think about that. What did he tell them to do? That's odd. Let's continue reading. And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse. But be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. Interesting. And he said unto them, Into what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when ye depart from thence, thence, take off or shake off the dust from under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Does this sound like any mission trip you have been on? Have you gone on any trip like this intentionally? <laughs> have you ever had a friend tell you, I'm going on a trip and I have packed nothing? I am prepared. Furthermore, I have no money. I don't even have a change of clothes. I'm feeling very good about this. Do we wonder how it went? We don't have to go very far. It's in the same chapter. Look there at verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Huh. Both what they had done and what they had taught. So apparently they didn't lack anything. In fact, if you read the account of it in Luke, they say, Lord, even the spirits were subject unto us, right? And he told them not to repent in that, but to repent in that their names are written in the books of heaven. Judas was in that trip. What do you think they learned when they went without those things on this trip? Okay. So, once they did that, then they were done. The next time's like, okay, we really need to be prepared the next time. No? 
Specifically, what did they learn regarding how God would take care of them? Did he do a good job, or did God do even better than they thought? Yeah. I like to speak with more of a Sabbath school style, so you can speak up in your answers. Amen? Amen. All right. I don't really preach sermons. I do Sabbath school class. <laughs> Amen. So, how many of you have heard anyone speak about this before? You know, in America, if you're not armed to the teeth with plans and instructions and plan B, C, and D after plan A, you are what? Irresponsible. Right? Yeah, you are. <laughs> Jesus provided for their needs, right? Did they were, not only did they not lack anything, but they accomplished their mission as well, right? Okay. Let's look at there at verse 30. And the disciples gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure, leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by the ship privately. Now, what happens next? The people followed him, right? That's how much they were attracted to Jesus. And now they went into a desert place. So this was a remote place. And Matthew chapter 10, I'm sorry, Matthew 9.38 says, Jesus saw the people and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion on them. And so he taught them. What did he do after teaching them? Let's look here in Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 6 again. Now his disciples are giving Jesus some uh, proper planning advice here. And when the day was, n was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. You see, what the disciples learned on the first trip out was that Jesus provided them the things that we think we have to provide for ourselves, which is a place to stay, shirt on our back, something to eat, and, of course, the success of whatever task they're about. So Jesus provided for who on that trip? The people they were serving or the disciples? The disciples. Now, the people they were serving were also served because the disciples were bearing the gospel message, right? The disciples are about to learn another lesson here. And he answered to them and said, in verse 37, Go ye, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? And he said unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to sit, I'm sorry, they, he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. How many of you have tried to be the leader of 15,000 people and get them to all listen to you and all sit down quietly? <laughs> See, the disciples would be given lessons in how to work with people. Amen? Yeah. It takes some patience and some people skills to do what they were instructed to do right there. By the way, were the disciples sent on their first mission trip without preparation? The way we think about it, they were. Material things, right? But what kind of preparation had Jesus given them? What had they been doing with Jesus up until that time? They were learning by watching and doing, right? So when Jesus had a sermon, when Jesus was healing the people, Right? Oftentimes the disciples are the ones bringing the people to be healed, right? The disciples were the ones working with the crowd, working with the people. Jesus had prepared them very well. He set them up for success on that mission trip. He knew what he was doing. Jesus is about to show them that 
God will also take care of the needs of the people that he is sending them to. Verse 40, and they sat down in ranks. By the way, that's a big miracle. I don't know if you realize that. That is a miracle. If you don't believe me, just go try it. Try to command 15,000 people to sit down in ranks. Report back to me. Okay. I say that because there's 5,000 men. If you had a woman and one child, that would be 15,000, right? Okay. And when he had taken the loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave his, to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. What about when he sends out the 70? Was that kind of a mission trip just a one and done? Okay, that was a nice novelty trip. What does he do when he sends out the 70? Uh, that is in Luke, Luke chapter 10, if you want to go there. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. So, who do you think was given the encouragement to the 70? Who do you think was like, oh yeah, let me tell you how this worked out last time? The 70, right? By the way, our mission reports a biblical concept? Yeah. That's why we all loved, if you're as old as me, or I guess it's come back now, right? What do they play as Sabbath mornings? Mission Spotlight. I love those. So, the disciples of the 70, they learn the same thing. Is that just for their times, or is it also for us? For us? All right, just checking. I want to let you um, in on what the Lord has been doing. Um, since 2010, our humble little team, our humble, no name, no money, no resource team, has been working on this uh, message and on this principle. When the Haiti earthquake hit in 2010, my two friends uh, who had done the International Rescue and Relief Program at Union College, like I had, classmates, they said, we don't want to be bench-warming Christians, we want to go do the gospel. So they went to Haiti on one-way tickets, into a disaster zone, no money, no translators, no plan, no connections, no organization to fall back on. Is this wise? No, this is irresponsible. How could they do such a thing? <laughs> so, on the way there, Brock, he's a paramedic by now. He's gone through four years of college. He's learned everything he needs to know. And my friend Chris says, Brock, you realize we don't know what we're doing, right? And Brock's like, well, what do you mean? It's like, like, we have the training, we have the experience, you know, I'm a paramedic, you've got your rescue experience too. And Chris is like, no, we don't know what we're doing. And they thought about it for a bit, and they're like, oh, you, you're right, you're right. They got rejected at the airport, they couldn't fly in. <laughs> they prayed. The people at the counter said, all right. You can fly with all of your 
enormous pile of tents for the people of Haiti? Go ahead. They got to the U.S. consulate or embassy at uh, Dominican Republic because you couldn't fly into Haiti uh, because it was closed. And they said, "Ah, who are you? Uh, Who are you here with? Yeah, uh, let's throw your stuff here on this truck. See ya. (laughs) Drop their stuff off outside, drove the truck back in, and they're just outside the chain link fence like, right? Their team, they're like, we have to keep working on this. We have to keep going. They said, the only way in is to catch this supply envoy. And they said, well, we've been going for three days straight trying to make this happen at our own strength. It's time to rest. It's the Sabbath. They said, no, that's dumb. You need to catch this envoy of trucks. They said, no, we're going to rest. The convoy of trucks was delayed for days. God put them on military helicopters, flew them over the big, snarled mess of traffic that prevented everybody else from getting in. So once they were there, the locals said, hey, yay, the Americans are here. This is all going to work out. And they said, well, what can you do for us? Give us that some good old American aid. And they said, well, we don't have anything, sorry. They said, but we're here by prayer, and if you pray, the Lord will feed the 5,000 tomorrow. (laughs) The next day, by no power of their own, supply trucks start coming in. 5,000 are fed. Seven baskets left over. Giant barrels of water. Those are the baskets. <laughs> Those are the scraps, the single water bottles. They picked them all up because they didn't want to waste, threw them in the barrels. The helicopter convoy, when they went to get on, I'm sorry, I missed this part. Teams from around the world are there in their nice uniforms with their bankrolled organizations. And this shabby team kind of parts the way and walks through. The team that nobody has bothered to look at. The team that (laughs) the pilot of the aircraft was like, "Uh, are you really the names that I'm calling out? And they're like, yeah. (laughs) It's like, I don't know who you know, or how you got on this flight. God turned that mission trip into Haiti a giant success. And my godless soul heard their testimony, and I said, okay, Corey, it's time. It's time. I need to see about this God thing, see if it's real, and I know it's a 100% all the way proposition. All right, Lord, let's do it. Let's have the Lord reach my hardened soul at the age of 28. Hold me from the pit of sin, as it were. So, decided to renew my rescue stuff and went and taught at Daystar for a while, and that was wonderful. Um, before I accepted Christ, I thought I had everything I wanted in life, according to my plan. <laughs> I had the lifestyle, I lived at a resort, a ski resort town. There was 12 ski resorts around the Lake Tahoe where I lived had enough money for the lifestyle I wanted, which wasn't like tons of money, but it was enough, right? And had my offer to be pro downhill mountain biker. I thought that was like going to bring me joy and what I wanted. No. <laughs> what was better, I found, was teaching youth how to ride bicycles. That was far more fulfilling. That was wonderful. God blessed me to be able to do that at Daystar. It was awesome. Just a little testimony about how the Lord works when you surrender your plans to him. So what has the Lord been doing in the world of mission rescue work? That's what you really want to hear about. Praise the Lord. That's how he's uh, been working. Hurricane Harvey hit in 2017. uh, Dropped 50 inches of rain on Houston and the surrounding area. Do you know what 50 inches of rain does to a place? Talking about water over the rooftops, it's category four hurricane as well. This was a real mess. Uh, you can throw every resource the United States government and every non-government or non-government organization has at this, and it won't be enough. 
The leader of Union College's International Rescue and Relief Program was by now my close friend at that time. And he said, Corey, do you want to go down to Houston? I said, sure, why not? Uh, we'd been doing mi lots of like disaster response mission training trips, but I was like, I'd like to actually do a response. So we went without a plan, without any money and all, you know, the usual, how, how it goes, right? And the Lord really provided. Uh, we were able to do a couple of water rescues, which is what we love to do. Real simple stuff, but hey, it was sure fulfilling. And then we went to the town of uh, Port Arthur. In Port Arthur, the water had already receded, and we're like, what are we going to do here? Well, we drove around, and we found the Church of Christ. They were giving out the supplies of the food and water because, you know, nobody had that stuff anymore. So we asked them, hey, could you use a hand? They said, yes, we really need help. I said, praise the Lord. So they were having a assembly line basically where people would drive through and they would just throw in a couple cases of water, a couple boxes of food, a couple boxes of cleaning supplies, medical stuff. And I thought, this is good, sufficient, it's reaching a lot of people. And so I asked the pastor, different denomination now, can we give out our literature at uh, your church? <laughs> yes. All right, good. Here it all is, check it all out. And for all your church members and your elders too. <laughs> Please try that, by the way. Um, come back and let me know how that works out. <laughs> um, the glory of it is that what God promises in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, verse 10, this is promised to the Israelites here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full... Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. What he's saying is here, you're going to get the resources of the world for God's plan, right? We didn't pay or arrange for any of those supplies to come for the Church of Christ, or Church of God, but whose gospel was in the hands of everyone receiving all those goods? Right? Next up, Florence. The next year, Hurricane Florence hits and destroys North Carolina. I live in Utah at the time, <laughs> and uh, drive my truck, pick up my friends, our teammates, right, of Gideon Rescue Company, Brock Meyer. You may have known him. Um, his older brothers do the Little Light Studio stuff. Um, we get there and we're like, great, we have a rescue boat this time. That's better than last time. <laughs> and, well, we had a rescue boat before, but we didn't have, like, the frame and the oars and all this stuff that you're supposed to have with it. Um, this time we did. We had actually the world's most competent rescue boat. Um, I'll show you a video about that sometime. You may have seen it if you were an academy student this week in the slides. Only ours is bigger. So and has motor. So uh, <laughs> we're there and we really want to do rescue, but because we, by mistake that we make, allow some of the mixed multitude to come in, people who want to do the rescue stuff, want to do the humanitarian aid, but aren't so much on the vision with us, with the gospel part, I think we kind of run around the wilderness for about three days. Once we get that figured out, we say, Lord, we'll do whatever. Before honor is humility, right? It's in Proverbs, I think it's 1836. So we go to the shelter and we say, Lord, we'll do whatever you want us to do. Shelter people will take out your trash, we'll do, and then they cut us off. If you want to pray with our people, if you want to talk with them and encourage them and do whatever you want to do, 
We said, well, yes, uh, actually, that's uh, really what we wanted. So we were able to do all of that, and we had the full blessing of everyone there at the Red Cross shelter. Amen? Glow tracks went out like they're going out of style. Show up and glow up. Right. Next up, Hurricane Michael. By this time, I'm like, you know, I'm not so sure about this whole driving my pickup from Utah thing. <laughs> we should get like a helicopter or a plane, but we don't have any money, so. How about a box truck on Craigslist? <laughs> a week before Hurricane Michael hits, God's like, okay guys, I know you're thinking on this whole plan down here of this box truck from Craigslist, but how about 40 planes, 50 planes full of the goods of the world to just give out to the affected people of Hurricane Michael? By the way, we have full use of the planes, we have the pilots, we have the gas, we have the maintenance, we have logistics all taken care of for us. We don't have to touch any of that stuff. Amen? Amen? Keep your liberty to share the gospel. Never compromise with any contract, any partnership that requires you to lose any of that liberty because you think you need the strength of the world, be it the Red Cross or FEMA or whatever, to go accomplish the work of the Lord. If you learn that lesson at your age rather than my age, Jesus just might come, okay? So, we go without the usual, the plan and all that. God provides through us, it's an uh, arrow bridge, they fly us in there, they fly us around in the disaster. But hey, you know, we don't have our um, connections like we would like. But, God sends my sister, who isn't like, a church member at this point in time, but they have a truck, her and her husband, and they have a trailer, which is really good because we need a way to transport 50 plane loads of goods from the airport to the local Seventh-day Adventist church. And by the way, there's only four of us. We need like 100 people to handle all this business. Do you think 100 like academy kids could do that job? You know, give stuff out? Are they qualified for that? Y'all could do that, right? Okay. Because <laughs> that's what they did. Academy students with two serve showed up at the church. We only talked with them like the day before. Hadn't planned this out at all. And they're like, hey, uh, we would like to operate there too. And we said, very good. We really need a lot of hands. Oh, and by the way, the president of the country is flying in tomorrow, and we're probably going to meet him, so if you could handle this whole point of distribution thing while we go and do that, that would be great. So I chose that night between spending my time to talk with the leader of an organization that takes Adventist youth to respond to disasters or meeting the president of the country. I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but, you know, they were saying he's flying into the airport, your team is the only one that has like, permission to continue functioning. Everybody else is shut down. Our planes can still come in. We still have access to our hangar and the rest of the airport, you know, the office and such. Nobody else can function. But the little no-name team that doesn't have a penny in the bank, we don't. I'm not kidding. <laughs> You can check my bank account if you want. So, who gets to function at the airport that day? We do. But I choose to spend my time talking with the leader of 2Serve because I value our partnerships with the Adventist Church above the partnerships of the world. Amen. By the way, which one worked out for the best? I didn't actually meet the uh, President of the United States, right? He was supposed to stop and do the meet and greet thing. And we still got him a great controversy, though, so it worked out well, okay? 
Yeah, the Secret Service agent that was in our hangar, we had four hours with him. What do you think's gonna happen, right? <laughs> he took up our cause. He's like, yes, I'll get this in his hands. Here's one for you too. Read it, make sure you like it. Hand it to him. <laughs> The Lord will lead you into wonderful ways if you'll give your life to him now. There's nothing special about me or any of my other teammates. We're the least of the least, and I don't mind saying so. I actually glory in saying, we are a small, no-name, little, humble team. And you know what's great about that? It's visible to everyone involved God gets all the credit. God gets all the glory. Because we know you guys couldn't make that happen. We're like, yeah, you're right. That's how it is. Hurricane Dorian hits the Bahamas. Category 5. 230 mile an hour winds. 185 mile an hour sustained winds. That's the inside of a tornado. Imagine that for 36 hours. Tornadoes pass by and they're done. Hurricane Dorian sat and just destroyed the Bahamas. If you haven't seen the pictures, it's the end of the world in preview. You should take note, as should the rest of the world. Here comes the no-name team. No money. <laughs> no contacts. What are they going to do? What can we do? All of our own strength, nothing. Once again, I just want to make that clear. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of and not of. Amen? I know of... Christian and Seventh-day Adventist teams that have put humanitarian work above the gospel work. God is not providing those opportunities. God does provide it when they step forward in faith, though. I've seen it. You can ask me about it later. I'd be love to tell you the story. So, the Bahamas... We drive to Florida because the Hurricane Dorian's supposed to hit Florida. We have our rescue boats outfitted this time. I've been training and building these rescue boats with the owner and manufacturer of them. God blessed us with that relationship. Been doing class six water. That's the personal fulfillment of my dreams, by the way. That's why I mentioned that. Not because it's awesome per se, other than the fact that God will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. If they're sanctified desires, right? I'm doing that wild white water because I have a higher goal in mind. I get to call it training, right? I'm super blessed. If you get to call what you love training, you're really in a sweet spot. You should do it. I recommend it. That's what I was doing this week, by the way. Right? So, we don't have any place to stay, we don't have food. We don't have water. I mean, besides the backpacks that are with us. We've thought about not even going with the backpacks. Uh, we have the backpacks. We go in there. God blesses us with the most uh, intact building on the whole island. This is the International Airport of the Bahamas, Abaco Island. <laughs> we, saw, we come up and talk with the airport officials and we say, We'd like to fly a lot of planes in with supplies. Um, can we store that stuff somewhere? And they say, yeah, right this way. Here's the customs department. It's all yours. It has power. It has toilets. It has, like, security. The military, what is left of them, <laughs> are watching our stuff for us. Nobody's let in or out. All we have to do is mop the place up. It's got a little water in it. The rest of the island doesn't look like that. 
The rest of the island succumbed. Oh, the winds, right? There was also a 25-foot storm surge. The island's like five feet tall, right? The rest of the island doesn't look like the accommodations that God gave the team that went in there for him. So, what about our mission, right? Everbridge is supposed to fly in hundreds of planes, some bureaucratic red tape, one thing or another. They don't really like, I think we get like two. But that's okay, because there's lots of other people flying planes in, and when they land, they don't have teams to distribute those goods, and we say, hey, we'll handle these goods for you if you want, we'll give them out. Yeah, great, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> They fire up their plane and they leave. Leave us with the goods. That continues to happen. So we're like, well, we have goods. Um, we thought about buying a cart because we really wanted to like move goods around without carrying it all on our hands. There's this cart there between two to like totally destroyed, mangled up cars. It's perfect for our needs. It's heavy duty. It'll like unload a plane uh, all by itself. It's strong enough and it rolls around good. I say that because like, we went to Home Depot the day we flew in there and we're like, we need to buy a cart. We didn't need to buy a cart, God provided it. <laughs> we also were like, we need to buy a satellite communication device, you know, because probably the cell phones aren't gonna work there. Like what do towers do when water and you know, those winds hit them? They don't work, we know from Hurricane Michael. Who's the team that had the cell phone that worked? Come on, <laughs> ours. Who had like a special radio dude come with our team and set up special radio stuff? I don't even know what it is, but he can communicate with all this radio stuff too. Come on, come on. No name team. We should just change it to that actually. That would be better. The name of the game on Abaco Island is evacuate. See, in America, when you come to respond, you want to give stuff out because people are like still able to live there. Not on Abaco Island. Abaco Island, there is nothing left. Whoever's there wants to leave. Who's placed in the place where people are going to leave? Revolving door of people in need of food and water and whatever else we already have in store in our secure little area. You know what we do bring? We bring literature. <laughs> and lots of it. You know when we give them the food and the water and the literature, you know what they turn down? The food and the water. When the world responds to disasters, what do they provide? Food, water, medical. You need to think about this next part. What is needed after a disaster? Who is the only group prepared for that mission? Have you been doing training for that? Have you been doing the training of the disciples? The world will say, you're not qualified. You don't have this or that certification. So we get those two, right? We do. Helps open doors. I want you young people to understand you are qualified. Can you hand out food and water and pray with people and talk with them with the love of Jesus? Can you give the three angels messages, the message for the world at this time? You're the only team that can. Humanitarian teams are a dime a dozen, I'll tell you that. They do a good work, but they don't do the work. 
I praise God for the work they do. Those people need that food and water. But when a 65-year-old woman comes up to you and says, I was in my house with my husband and the water was coming up. A two-by-four hit him in the back of the head and he went down. And here I am. What does that person need? Does that person just need food and water? Have you been training? I believe you have been. I want to bring back a good report, and I want to tell you the truth. The church has every right and every ability to function in that environment. Do you think we're successful because we have training and experience? Very seldomly do we utilize our special technical training and experience. Moment by moment, we're using our discipleship experience. Have you been training? Amen? I believe you have been. I've seen it. I've been blessed to be a part of it. Indonesia. What time is it? Am I out of time? I think I probably am. I have 15 minutes left? Oh, I have. Indonesia. 2019, big earthquake hits and does what to Indonesia? Levels it and then floods it. No name team. <laughs> Sends in a crippled man. And a man your age. Least of the least. Getting real? Do you think you're not qualified? Do you think you're not physically able? No name team gets arrested. <laughs> At the airport. Realizes they're not really watching us. No name team escapes. <laughs> no name team gets arrested again several days later. <laughs> pulling people's deceased family members from the rubble. This is a Muslim country. No name team gets brought into the belly of the military compound. No name team notices. <laughs> They're not really watching. No name team walks out of the military base. Broad daylight. A four star general was the man commanding that team to watch the no name team. And then he went to go get a guy in a suit. He must have been pretty important. Something like King Herod arresting Peter, I suppose. No name team doesn't have insurance. Can you call your insurance company for something like that? <laughs> We're in Indonesia. Uh, something has happened. <laughs> no name team meets the only Adventist policeman on the island. Aww. 
Do you need more? Or could we just take it from the Bible? How much more do we need? How much more do you need? You need to keep walking with the Lord. Is the Lord walking with you to the next disaster response? He may be. I hope to see you there. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, We love you. We wish the rest of the world would know you and love you too. Bless us to bring your message, to love you, and receive your gift of salvation. May your spirit move us where you would wish us to be May we go there in faith with the joy of the Lord, fearing nothing, coming boldly before the throne of grace. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your Sabbath. Mobilize these youth, we trust. In Christ's righteous name, amen.